when you go to a tournament, you actually see the impact that these young people can have. And it's in every area of life. Hello, and welcome to the Arts of Language podcast with Andrew Poudois, founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing, or as many like to say, IEW. My name is Julie Walker, and I'm honored to serve Andrew and IEW as the Chief Marketing Officer. Our goal is to equip teachers and teaching parents with methods and materials which will aid them in training their students to become confident and competent communicators and thinkers. So it has been stated, I don't know how true this is, that the number one fear that people have is the fear of public speaking. Have you heard that before, Andrew? I've heard it from people who are selling public speaking courses. Okay. <laughs> but yes, it evidently ranks very high on the general fears that people carry around. And, you know, there's kind of people fall into two categories, people who like to stand in front of other people and talk and people who dread it. Mm -hmm. But I do think, and I think you would agree with me, that that fear can be overcome. Oh, absolutely. So were you always, because you obviously fall into the camp of get me in front of a big group of people as much as possible. Were you ever nervous doing public speaking? Not necessarily nervous about the idea of it. Mm -hmm. And I, I chalk that up to having performed musical instruments oh, true, yeah. as a young child, you know, playing the violin, going to recitals and all that. Mm -hmm. I did take a public speaking class in high school. I don't remember anything about it, but I, <laughs> it, it wasn't a negative. When I did my first public lecture to people who were paying money to listen, I only had to do 10 minutes of a whole session and I was nervous not about the people. I was nervous about my boss who was going to give me very specific feedback on my presentation. So I prepared really intensely mm -hmm. for those 10 minutes. And that was a good thing. And then, of course, over the years, it gets easier and easier. And now uh, I don't necessarily get nervous, but sometimes I get curious. Mm -hmm. What am I actually going to say? <laughs> <laughs> you don't know until you open your mouth and out spew the words. I, uh, I have had that nervousness. Mm -hmm. I remember the first time we did a podcast together, episode one, which we blew up, by the way. That is no longer available. Oh. Well, you know, we are in the high 400s now. And so we have, we're, it's just a kindness to our listeners. We have eliminated the earlier ones so that people don't feel like they have to start at the very beginning. But trust me when I say, dear listener, you don't want to hear that first one <laughs> because I was very scripted. And, you know, just over the weeks and months and now years, I've become much more comfortable. So, yeah, it could be a little nerve wracking. Well, but like anything, the more you do it, the easier it becomes. It's true. It's true. And it's true with everything. And oftentimes the hurdle is just getting started. Like, how do I actually start preparing to speak right. in front of a group of peers right. or an audience? Right. And we teach this in all of our writing courses in the first of our nine units. Yeah. Webster was very clear. You know, when he put the whole thing together, he didn't actually want it to be called a writing program. He wanted people to think of it as a written and oral communication program. Mm -hmm. So in his world, that was essential from the very beginning. Yep. And so over the years, as this idea of public speaking grew, you and your own children were involved in competitive speech and debate, and you developed a course called Speech Boot Camp. And it was for your own students. Well, yeah, we were in California, and I had been doing it for, oh gosh, five, six years. We started a club. We were with the National Christian Forensics and Communication Association, NCFCA. We became an affiliate, and there were a lot of clubs in California, lots mm -hmm. of tournaments, lots to do there. And we really didn't know what we were doing, but we <laughs> got, you know, the book on how to do policy debate and 
you know, I knew a little bit about public speaking. I had done a year of Toastmasters mm -hmm. training when I was younger. So I brought in some of, some of my notes from that. So we did. And the club basically doubled every year. We started with four, then we had eight, then we had 16, then we had 30 some. And it got to the point where I wanted to give people kind of an opportunity to get a sense of what it might be like to be in the club and do competitive speech and debate. Mm -hmm. So I created a summer course. I called it Speech Boot Camp. Yep. And it was four classes in two weeks in <laughs> August. And that kind of became a prerequisite, not an absolute, but a unofficial prerequisite that if you wanted to join our debate club, then you would do this speech boot camp with, with Andrew Pudewa. Well, in 2009, we moved to Oklahoma and everyone's saying, but who's going to do speech boot camp? And I thought, well, let's make a video. Mm -hmm. I've got equipment. I can do it. It'll be a product we can sell and y'all can have it and use it for as long as you want to. So that was how the original speech boot camp product came into being, right. which was, what can I do in four short classes that will get people at least interested, if not excited, about joining our homeschool speech and debate club? And so uh, we sold that for yeah, 13 years. At least, yeah, yeah, at least 10. And of course, we have now discontinued that. We product. have because. Because now we have a 12-week course, Introduction to Public Speaking. And we do things like teaching students how to memorize, which is very important mm -hmm. when you're learning how to do speeches, self-introductory speech, a narrative expository, persuasive. Will you even, at the end, do some impromptu speeching, impromptu <laughs> speeches? <laughs> <laughs> and really, there's a secret agenda here. Maybe not so secret. Because you talk about it in week 12. Yeah. And that is, now, what do you do with all this knowledge? You should join a speech club and participate in competitive speech and debate. How about NCFCA? Yeah, it's like going from kind of a basic army-style boot camp into the Rangers, mm -hmm. right? The Navy SEALs <laughs> yes. of, of speech, because that is by far the best organization with the best training NCFCA, and yes. the best culture. It is the best thing happening in the world of communications training for young people today. Well, we really should get someone who's, I don't know, someone in charge of the whole thing. Wouldn't on our it be podcast? awesome if we could get our friend Kim Cromer to come on the podcast? <laughs> Hi, Kim. Hello, Andrew and Julie. Uh, we love you so much, Kim. You're an amazing woman and you are doing such a good work. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me today. Andrew and I have been running parallel you know, with speech and debate for a while, but it's always a, a blessing to be alongside you guys. Yeah. So I was at Nationals last summer when it was in Minnesota, which is where I was born and raised. And so I was happy to have an excuse to go home and visit the folks, but to witness firsthand the finalists who are either giving speeches, which is what I participated in as far as a judge, and the debate tournament. Oh my goodness. So, so incredible the work that these students, teens, high school teenagers are doing. And Andrew, you're going to be there this year. I am. I'm very much looking forward to it. I've never had any of my kids or students make it to nationals. So mm -hmm. I never have had a real good excuse to go. But this time I don't have any students anymore. And my kids, are, my grandchildren are not old enough, but I am looking so forward to being there and, of course, meeting probably a lot of parents that I have intersected with at one point or another in the past decade. And I always say, if you're feeling a little low on hope for the future of the world, which is basically my condition all day, every day. But, <laughs> you know, if you're in kind of a funk, like things are just not going well, you know, whatever, socially, politically, economically, and, and you need a shot of pure energy to give you hope, pure hope. You just get yourself to a speech and debate tournament and you will see young people operating just at the peak of human potential almost, doing things at 16, 17, 18 years old that I could never do and have never done and would never be able to do. And you think, yes, 
you know, these are the young people. These are the ones who are going to meet the qualifications for leadership, which is a good person who speaks well. Mm -hmm. And that goes, of course, all the way back to Aristotle. So I guess my quick question for you, Kim, is how did this culture come to be and how have you maintained it over the years? How is it that this homeschool speech and debate world is just so extraordinarily beautiful and inspiring? It's true, Andrew. It really is. And, you know, the credit goes to those early folks, Mike Ferris and his daughter, Christy Scheip, who saw the need, especially for homeschool students when it first started, for homeschool students to have an opportunity to build their public speaking skills through competitive speech and debate. And over the years, um, it's just continued to grow and thrive. And I really believe the answer to your question about why it's been able to, you know, continue in the way that it has is pretty unique um, in the world. And it's because we have such a constructive community. We are a community of like-minded believers who, you know, band together on that core principle of there's an important call on all of our lives that we can be ambassadors, that we can be good civil servants, we can be good neighbors, we can be whatever it is that's necessary because we can be effective communicators. And it's just been a really great opportunity to continue to to pour in because as you said, when you go to a tournament, you you can think this sounds like a great idea just by hearing about it. But when you go to a tournament, you actually see the impact that these young people can have. And it's in every area of life. You know, I think some people, and maybe even me in the beginning, thought, well, most of these kids are going to be attorneys or politicians or maybe even a pastor. But the truth is, they're out now. We have almost two and a half decades of alumni who are impacting the world in all kinds of places for good. So it's just encouraging. It's also exciting to see how many of them make really lifelong friendships. They maintain connection and sometimes they even marry each other. <laughs> we, it is true. We have a couple, we have two couples here in Eastern Oklahoma that were debate partners in high school and are now married with kids. And <laughs> it's uh, it's very, very exciting to see. I'm, I always tell people that in most social situations, and you put kids together, especially teenagers, they tend to sink down to the lowest common level of attitude or vocabulary or content or, you know, emotional world. They just kind of sink down. It's like if you want to have friends, you got to come down to their level because you can't really expect them to be different than they are. Mm -hmm. And that's frustrating for parents too, you know, like a church youth group. It's just, sometimes it's just not a net good. But an NCFCA tournament mm -hmm. is almost the opposite. It is so amazing because everyone there is striving to be their best. And the younger students are wanting to be like the older students in terms of how good they are and the quality of their content and the, the quality of their heart that they put into it, the level of work and excellence, the refinement of presentation skills and their kindness towards each other. And then the older students, they, they know they have this responsibility to be a model, to be something worthy of striving for. And I cannot think of any other environment where you can put teenagers and have that be true, which is, I think, the greatest blessing of being part of it, let alone the skills, the experience, the friendships, the potential spouses, you know, all that <laughs> stuff. But it's this, everyone is just striving to be the best they can be. And that is, I think, what really gives hope to me mm -hmm. when I go there and 
I don't have kids in, but I've tried to find an excuse to go and, and help out and judge at a tournament or two, you know, a couple times a year for the past many years. And it's the same. It's the same goodness that I remember when I was in the thick of it, volunteering and working and being there three days nonstop and driving half a day to, or a whole day to go. How is this possible that this very, very high striving for excellence, you know, spiritual, intellectual, you know, even dressing well? Oh, my goodness, Andrew, I have to insert this. <laughs> One of the things that just blew my mind, and it's so it's such a non sequitur. The dressing, the girls, they had the killer shoes. Uh -huh. Like, I'm like, I wish I could have shoes like that. <laughs> now, sometimes they'd be carrying them because you probably couldn't actually walk in those red stiletto heels. Like they could stand up for a 10 but, minute speech. Wow, yeah. do these kids know how to dress? Yes. Yeah. So, I guess, you know, what's the trick of creating that everyone's striving to be the best and no one's sinking down? That's the magic of the culture. And I think if you could bottle that up and sell it, you could become truly wealthy. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, Andrew. You know, I really feel like it's, as you said, putting them in this competitive environment where iron can sharpen iron really does pull them up rather than pull them down. You know, the competitors, even as they're competing with one another are learning. And of course, they're young people who are really learning, though, to value their opponent as a person and to be able to debate ideas rather than debating people. Wow. And that would be unique in our society if we could bottle that and sell it. I, um, I have my favorite book of the year for 2023. It was called How to Think Like Shakespeare by Scott Newstock. We had him on the podcast. Brilliant, brilliant book. Mm. And one of the things that was very distinct about that Renaissance education of Shakespeare's time was discourse. And that there was this formal training in getting together and listening to an argument and then responding to the argument and have someone listen to your response and then make a response to that and then responding to that in this kind of structured, very civilized way, something we don't see on TV or presidential debates much anymore. But that idea of, of honing the mind through discourse as a key to kind of a restoration of culture, the idea that you know, it was the recovery of the humanities and the liberal arts in the Renaissance era that brought in all of the amazing achievement, the literary achievement, the mm -hmm. cultural achievements, the artistic and scientific achievements. And so I, I was thinking about that and then thinking about, oh, I get to go and be at NCFCA Nationals and how there's such a connection between what you are doing there and, and all the parents and all the kids, not just you, but you in the grand sense of everyone involved, what's happening there, and really the potential for a restoration of discourse in the public forum, a la, you know, Renaissance. Could we have a Renaissance in our world if we could have a Renaissance in our education? And I would view this culture of speech and debate as being so critical on that. And it's not something that, kids like pick up on instantly. It has to be modeled and practiced. And what are some of the ways that you see, you know, these clubs? And, and for people who don't know, if you live somewhere, if it's a decent sized city, there's probably an NCFC affiliated club somewhere near you. If there isn't, you can actually start one, which is a little harder, especially if you don't know what you're doing, like me, the first time. <laughs> um, but you you get in a club, and, and so you have these people who, some of them kind of know what they're doing, and some of them kind of don't. And then they go to the first tournament, and then they learn more, and then they come back and work a little more. And, and somehow they learn this art of discourse. What do you think are some of the major contributing factors to that? achievement. And I would call it an achievement in the real sense of the word. Right. 
I agree with you, Andrew. You know, I, I think it is the camaraderie. It is the coming alongside that is unique in our world that allows these young people to see, as you said, the older ones kind of instructing the younger ones and allowing them to increase their confidence, really to gain some poise, encouragement, certainly the idea that they have a place to be heard and they are able to really share the things that they're passionate about. And I think just inherently that encourages them. They often come home from the tournaments, as you very well know, and they read their ballots. They read the feedback from adults who have taken time out of their life to give them constructive feedback to say, these are the things that you did great. And I was a little confused by this particular point. Mm -hmm. And I think just inherently that bolsters their confidence that does sort of, you know, turn that flywheel that you're referring to of being able to build that skill. I mean, it might seem even a little bit contradictory that competition would, would encourage them. But it really is that dangling carrot that drives the skill build. And so coming, receiving feedback, practicing, as you referenced at the beginning of just getting used to doing that sort of thing, but then being encouraged and seeing there are adults who are taking this very seriously and pouring time in and energy and taking the opportunity to give me feedback that can make me a better communicator. And so I think it does just continue to build that opportunity to increase the ability to have positive discourse. And it's really, I mean, you would remember, it's not just in the competition rounds. It's actually between rounds when they're having conversations in the hangout space that really does I think that fellowship and that camaraderie does also contribute to that. So, Andrew, you started talking about the small clubs in the cities, and then they have local tournaments. How does a student get from Atascadero, California, which is where your first club was, all the way to nationals? Can well, anyone that, go to nationals? Well, that's that's more a question for Kim. Mm. Um, the the structure is in regions. And so each region is kind of governing itself in terms of tournaments. And then I think there are some national invitational tournaments Mm -hmm. that may be outside your region and you could travel and compete in those tournaments. I don't, I don't know. How, how do you get to nationals? What, what's the requirement there? Well, you could be Andrew Poudois and be invited to speak at nationals. That's the only way I would get there, but, um, (laughs) How, how do you know if you qualify for nationals? That's a great question. And the kids ask that often <laughs> mm-hmm. because they certainly want to go to their regional championship or to the national championship. We have a, a very well-developed qualification system that does allow competitors from each tournament to progress in the different levels of competition. So If you advance to elimination rounds, which is typically about the top 50%, if you advance to the elimination rounds at any tournament, you qualify to your regional championship. And we have 12 regions all over the country. And each of those championships sends a significant number. So it's usually about 25% of the students who are there receive some type of invitation to the national championship. So we have 4,000 or so students who are competing around the country right now, still in our regular seasonal competition. And we will narrow that down to the national championship where we'll have just over 500 competitors. So it's pretty steep in terms of advancing, you know, all the way to the national championship, but it's still a really good opportunity for kids to, you know, to be able to walk through 
different levels of competition. And as you said, to mix with one another, it is true. We have national opens and national mixers where you can come from any region to any area. We try to put them in places that are exciting like Phoenix, Arizona in January, Mm. because those of us who live in the North really are excited about going to Arizona (laughs) in January. Yeah, so that's that's how they qualify. And and of course, some kids may compete in one single event like policy debate or Lincoln Douglas debate, but then some kids would compete in speech events and I think you can do several of those at a time. And some kids will do the whole thing, the the grand slam. They'll do a, a debate event and several speech events. And then they may qualify in one or more of those events for nationals. I, I want to just go back to something that occurred to me. You were talking about how the students are grateful for the input of the adults who are giving their time. And I always thought that was quite remarkable. Every single time you would judge anybody for anything, they would always, without fail, in a very sincere way, not perfunctory at all, but in a very sincere and real way, Mm -hmm. say to the judge or judges, thank you for judging. And, you know, I juxtapose that against kind of the motto of young people running around, you know, in the world saying, don't judge me, you know, don't (laughs) judge my clothes, don't judge the way I talk, don't judge my music, don't judge anything about me, you you know, don't judge lest you be judged. And, you know, they have this very, very narrow concept. And here you go to a tournament and the motto is, thank you for judging me. Mm-hmm. Please judge me. Yeah. I'm grateful. <laughs> I, I, you know, to me, that is like the biggest difference you can see there in the culture. And I just wanted to mention that because it occurred to me. And so we see the op- opportunities here. If someone wants to get involved with NCFCA, that's the website, right? It is. NCFCA.org. Mm-hmm. And you've got regions and clubs are listed and people can ask for contacts in their areas. I think the best way to do it is just go to a tournament mm-hmm. and meet people and see what it's like mm-hmm. and then decide if you want to you know, go to the next step or not. We have obviously worked together on some projects in the past to create some education materials that are specific and applicable to NCFCA speech and debate, which has some, you know, particular technical guidelines mm-hmm. to to doing it. Mm-hmm. But we're also hoping to get more people just like on the runway mm-hmm. toward that without the the frightening aspect of it being too overwhelming. A gentle approach. Too, too, too complex. <laughs> so we, we hear like the idea of easy plus one. Mm-hmm. So just getting your, you know, foot in the pool, so to speak. What, what do you find is a great way for people to do that without being overwhelmed? You know, Andrew, I think one of the best ways for folks to get involved and see if they really think this is something they'd like to participate in is summer events. The clubs that you referenced, many of them, um, and they are independent clubs. There are about 160 um, around the country, and most of them host some sort of camp in the summer. Mm -hmm. It can be one day or a couple of days. We do some online camps in summer, and, and those run for one or two days about some of the specific subjects that we're going to offer. And I I feel like that's really just the best way that if you're going to talk about dipping your toe in and and to really see what it would be like to participate, that's really one of the best ways. So I think another thing that we need to mention, Andrew, because this podcast is actually being released just days before you are going to be in South Carolina and we have a lot of listeners who live in the east in the eastern seaboard area oh, sure. and they can actually you know just jump in a car carolinas yeah um, yeah so south Alabama, carolina so kim tell us a little bit about Florida. nationals and what kind of speech events you're going to have Andrew speak at 
at nationalism. Fortunately, I'm not being judged. He's not being judged. This is true. <laughs> the, no ballots will be issued for his talk. But what I love about this, Andrew, is they can kind of get their toe in the water in both ways. They can hear you speak, but then they can actually attend mm-hmm. some of the student competition. Right, Kim? Right. Is this open that people can... T- Absolutely. Absolutely is. You know, we'd encourage people to come and watch. Um, we'd also encourage them to come and be part of our judging pool. Mm. One of the things that is unique about us is that we, because our goal is real life communication, we invite judges from the community, whether they have experience or no experience, to come and participate. So on the website, you can sign up to judge around and then come and hear Andrew speak. He's going to speak three times. We are super excited about that and share your preparing for persecution presentation. I think it's something a lot of families need to need to see and think about and pray through. So we'll be super excited about that. I might actually be nervous <laughs> if I'm speaking to a whole auditorium full of pros, <laughs> but I'm grateful for the opportunity. So Andrew is speaking June 2nd and 3rd. And of course, as our, as our custom, we'll put links in the show notes for everything that we've and referenced today. And we'll have, today. you know, some materials there for yeah. display. And of course, our product, I know you're chomping at the bit to let everyone Introduction to public know speaking, that we, a nice, we, we took way. speech boot camp, discontinued it, replaced it mm-hmm. with a infinitely superior product. Instead of four classes, it's 12. We just get to go into everything in more depth. And we've only been selling this, what, about a year? Mm -hmm. And I already have been at a few conventions this year and have, you know, parents and kids walking up to me saying, hey, we did your speech, uh, your uh, introduction to public speaking, and it went great. We did it with our little co-op or we did it in our family with a couple other families. And, and, oh, my daughter, she really didn't want to do it. And by the end of 12 weeks, she wants to know if she can do more. And that's how you know, okay, we've got a successful product here because it's changing the the attitude, the heart, the willingness. So we will we'll have that there. It's uh, not a formal speech and debate training course at all. And you've got that, mm-hmm. you know, NCFCA has that. Uh, so this is exactly what it says, introduction to public speaking. So hopefully people will, will come and take a look at that. Yep. Or they can actually get some some free lessons online. Exactly. Go to, I. you'll love this URL, Andrew. I don't even know if you know this. IEW.com slash free hyphen speech. So, free speech. Free oh, speech, yes. yeah. What a revolutionary <laughs> idea. Um, okay. Yeah. So people could, could try it out even before then. Right. Anything else you would love to let our listeners know, Kim, about NCFCA or your experience or why this is a the best thing going on in the world today? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think it is, Andrew, and I think that is the the linchpin is it gives the opportunity for young people to really build the skills that they're gonna take with them in their life to be effective wherever the Lord is going to call them, you know, wherever they're going to be planted. This is going to change the trajectory of of how they think about communication. We hear that testimony on a regular basis that this has changed my child's thought processes Mm -hmm. about where they're going to go in life. So we're just super excited, again, to encourage people to come and see it. We do have some online opportunities with the podcast coming out a little bit later before nationals. Um, it'll be into next season, but there's always online opportunities to go and see it. If you can't make it to South Carolina, but we certainly want to encourage you, you, you will see the cream of the crop there in terms of our competitors and you get to hear Andrew speak. And that's always a treat (laughs) for our families. I agree. Of course, they love to see him come and judge too. (laughs) Um, They're a little intimidated. So Andrew, you don't don't need to worry about being intimidated, but they are intimidated (laughs) when you come. Well, it's as close to 
a little taste of heaven as we can get on earth. I would put it that way. And so I will second that, encourage you. I, I think coming to a live tournament is going to be magnitudes better of an experience than an online thing, which is, you know, a, a far second best. So if you can possibly get to a tournament, if yep. not this year, then next year when, when it starts up again. Well, I want to end with an invitation, Kim. Could you please invite your speech winners to be guests on our podcast? Oh, great. Wouldn't that be fun to have, you know, a handful oh, of them? Oh, I love that. And, um, you know, we'll just plan to, I already marked it on our little calendar here, we'll plan to launch that July 10th, that particular episode that we have not yet recorded because we do not know who the winners are, but that'll give us a, a month or so to put that together. And, and I think it would be really awesome for our listeners who were not able to make it to Anderson, South Carolina, to at least get a taste of what they missed in June. Absolutely, Julie. That's a great idea. And Super. our young people would love to do that. Great. We'll plan on it then. Well, thank you, Kim, for being a part of our work here at IEW and specifically for joining us today on this podcast. And I will see you very soon. It's coming right up. So yes, we're very excited. Thank you both for having me and we'll be excited to um, see you in person. Thank you, Kim. Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, please subscribe to our podcast in iTunes, Stitcher, or Spotify, or just visit us each week at IEW.com slash podcasts. Here you can also find show notes and relevant links from today's broadcast. One last thing, would you mind going to iTunes to rate and review our podcast? This really helps other smart, caring listeners like you find us. Thanks so much.